It is a real pleasure to be here. This is my first Aspen Institute event, and I know RVCC quite well, and it is a wonderful group of folks, and I always learn as much or more, um, hopefully, than I contribute. Um, so my job is to share a little bit of information about the context that we're talking about, what's unique about the West. The first thing to know is that the West is more than half public lands, state and federal lands. And that has really shaped the relationship between communities and natural resources, particularly starting after World War II, when extraction of coal and oil and gas and timber and grazing from public lands really fueled the post-war economic boom, and communities grew up around these public lands and access to natural resources. But the presence of public lands also complicates management in some pretty significant ways. Public lands are fragmented, often in a checkerboard style between different owners who have different mandates, different constituents, and different regulations that they have to follow. For example, state lands are largely managed to generate revenue for public schools in the West. You have BLM, Bureau of Land Management, and Forest Service lands, which in the majority are managed for multiple uses, which include commodity extraction, recreation, and conservation. We also have protected wilderness areas, national wildlife refuges, and national parks that are managed very differently. And then we have sovereign nations, the tribes who are managing very large tracts of their own reservations, but also have very real interests in public lands as well. And the reason that that's important is it's very difficult for local communities to understand and navigate how all these competing interests affect their opportunities and the role of public lands in their local economies. And that confusion and sometimes difficulty in navigating is becoming ever more uh, hard to reconcile given the changes in the economy. And so as we have a legacy of extraction which has really changed the social contract in ways that is constraining the ability to use public lands for extractive activities. We've also had a tax revolt and restructuring in rural communities, which is putting significant pressure on public lands to strip away regulations and to maximize the use of commodities from these places. And so this push and pull factor has only increased the complexity and difficulty for communities to try to understand and work with public lands. So what I want to do next is just talk a little bit about those changes in the economy and what it means for the collaboratives. And collaborative efforts in these places are really driving the innovation and in trying to resolve some of these difficult challenges. So the first thing to know is that since the recession, the US economy has been doing great. We have had monthly income and employment gains consecutively since about 2010. The West is the fastest growing region of the country. And the Pacific Northwest, in particular, is growing faster than even the West is as a whole. So as a regional perspective, we're doing great. We're growing quickly. The nature of that growth has really changed. We've seen a dramatic shift away from manufacturing and natural resource sectors to services. And the most important of those services are these high wage innovation sectors, which almost all require a higher degree and they have multipliers, they're driving growth in the West. The other big change is in the nature of how people are being compensated. The growth of non-labor income, largely through dividends, interest, and rent, is one of the biggest trends in the West that is often not captured by a lot of the normal economic um, pundits. And, and as we think about the growth of non-labor income, it's important to understand what it is and how it actually contributes to growth in other sectors like construction and healthcare and finance. So this change in the structure of the economy has big implications for the geography of the West. A lot of these high wage service jobs are agglomerating in cities where they have access to capital, they have access to creative like-minded companies and an educated workforce. Nearly all of the new jobs in the West since the recession have located in cities, and just three cities in the Pacific Northwest are responsible for almost three quarters of all the new jobs and income. Seattle, Portland, and Boise. For the rural counties, 69% of them have not recovered the jobs that they lost during the recession. So we're starting to see a big divergence in the types of places that are doing well. In the West, we think about connection to metros as being one of the most important characteristics that determines your prospects. 
So it's not about urban and rural. There are a lot of non-metro places that are connected to cities that are actually growing and participating in the kind of growth that's happening in the cities. Bozeman, Montana, where I'm from, we're not a metro, but we are growing like crazy, and a lot of my neighbors and colleagues work in high-tech and innovation sectors, and they're largely based in cities like Seattle and Portland or San Jose, but they live in Montana um, for a variety of reasons. The isolated places are what my wife, Julia Haggerty, at Montana State University is starting to call the third west. They're not participating in those types of jobs because they don't have access to cities, they don't have the educated labor force. They're also suffering from restructuring and automation in traditional sectors. And so they are falling behind. They are losing jobs and wages are largely stagnant in these places. The Great Divergence describes this trend where increases in productivity in the economy are no longer translating into higher wages and more employment opportunities. So for example, in the Pacific Northwest, through the 90s, we lost a significant number of jobs in the timber industry. Three quarters of those jobs, or two thirds of those jobs, were lost due to automation and consolidation in timber mills and increasing productivity of working in the woods. So we just simply don't need as many people to, to do that work. That was overshadowed by the change in federal management, but it's a really important trend that we're seeing across manufacturing and natural resource sectors, and what it means is that a return to commodity production no longer is gonna provide the kind of value proposition for rural communities that it used to. And we need to rethink where that value proposition lies. So we took a close look at all of the communities, these are counties in the Pacific Northwest that were dependent on timber, measured as 20% of personal income, labor income from timber sector in the late 70s, early 80s, and then we looked at them again today. And what we found, remarkably, was that there's very little legacy of timber in their economic performance. There's no relationship between whether or not you used to be dependent on timber and how you're doing today. But actually, the performance of these places was entirely predictable. Those places that were connected to metropolitan areas, those places that had an educated labor force, and places that had natural amenities are growing. So our, we like to say in the office that if you have an airport, a university, and a national park, your problem is too much growth. If you don't have any of those things, you're probably not growing at all, and you might even be falling behind. But those rural places are still generating a significant amount of value. When you look at the county GDP data, Half of all the counties that have high GDP per, per capita in the West are non-metro counties. A third of them are rural. So natural resource and commodity booms can still lift these places. There's still value being generated, but it's not translating into growth. Half of all the non-metro counties that have high GDP per capita are losing population at the same time. So value in rural communities is not translating into economic opportunity. And one of the things that we think is happening is that a lot of outside forces, the institutions and the policies that are constraining the autonomy and the authority of local communities to retain wealth and invest it back into their communities are shaping the outcomes in these places. So for example, those same timber communities in the Pacific Northwest received substantial revenue from federal timber payments, from revenue sharing, sharing payments, and they were required to use that on an annual basis. So they weren't allowed to save it. It got spent annually and it drove down local property tax levies. And then Oregon, like many other states in the West, had a property tax revolt. And so now they are constrained in their ability to actually change their local fiscal circumstances. And so as the revenue went away and as the volume declined, these communities had nothing to show for it. They literally go bankrupt overnight when the activity ends. And they cannot see their way to diversifying because any new economic activity doesn't pay its way because they have an anemic tax base that they have very difficult time changing. So these outside forces are constraining the ability of these communities that are still producing wealth, still contributing to the economy from actually getting ahead. And so the last thing I'll say is that we're starting to think about what this means for communities, and this is a model that we've started thinking about for energy-dependent communities, but I think it also works for formerly timber-dependent communities and recreation-dependent communities as well. They have these vulnerabilities that are inherent to their geography and inherent to their small size that they need to try to overcome, but they are also facing all of these outside forces that are constraining their autonomy. And in the middle is where collaboration is really driving innovation. 
the collaborative groups are not only teaching us how to work on the landscape in ways that are sustainable and start to rebuild an economy in these rural communities, but they're also starting to show us the way to networking and changing policy at the state and regional and federal level so that we can start to build on the success stories. And so the real challenge is when we hear success stories and you say, well, how did that happen? What made that work in that community? It's often a story about an individual or a small group of people who were able to succeed against all the odds. So what we're trying to understand is how do we actually change the odds so that those people can do exceptional things and the rest of us can just get along and try to get ahead. And so that outside set of factors is something that I think we'll hear a lot about today and try to bring those stories forward. So thank you very much.